Welcome to Immersed. Immersed is a series around music, health, wellness, and technology. Each episode, we bring together a diverse array of perspectives to explore how music and sound can improve our lives. Immersed is brought to you by Studio Feed. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Welcome to Immersed. I'm Dave Srabara. In this episode, we are talking about the experience of music and sound and how fully immersive sound has this potent ability to positively affect our state of well-being. I've really been excited to host this conversation for a long time because it's one that opens up this idea that sound, vibration, energy, it is way more than just the stuff going into our ears. Well, what does that exactly mean and why does it matter? Well, when we think about listening to sound or music, we tend to only think about our auditory sense, but I'm constantly reminded that our entire bodies and all our senses are absorbing energy of sound, light, vibration all the time. Our entire bodies are listening machines that we never really turn off. Music is a powerful, powerful state shifter but engaging in more immersive experience or immersive listening is this such a potent way to move us into these optimal states of being and deeply affect our physiology. As you will hear, I am fortunate enough to have three seriously accomplished individuals on this panel to talk about this through the lens of their work. Incredibly, they're all creators. They're artists, scientists, pioneers, practitioners, and founders who are gonna talk about their unique journeys that have landed them where they are and inspired them to create impact through deeply immersive experiences. Their projects are all publicly available and accessible to anyone. Um, so anyone will be able to experience what we'll touch on today. Let me do a quick intro of each of them individually and then I promise I will stop talking and we can dive into the good stuff. Uh, with us today from California is Joel Shearer, a musician, composer, sound artist, solo artist, and touring musician with a prolific multi-decade career in the music industry, collaborating on numerous albums from Alanis Morissette's Grammy-winning Jagged Little Pill to Rise latest release, Home. He's worked on Academy Award-nominated film scores, toured and collaborated with notable artists like Dido, Annie Lennox, Joe Cocker, Damian Rice, Michael Blueblade, to name a few. He's released ambient albums playing with hypnotic soundscapes and his deep connection to sound and its effect on our physical states of being have led him to explore the intersections of sound and light as a founder of Chromasonic. And Kate Delorme is in Vancouver and she's a sound artist who works integrating immersive spatial sounds, sound landscapes, technology and sound healing. Kate has been working in sound design since the age of 16, highly involved and interested in sound's effect on an audience. As a professional sound designer, her work has been primarily in contemporary dance. Her designs are inclusive of high caliber recording and editing, composition, programming, live mixing, and interactivity. She's in Vancouver, where she's also the co-founder of Loeb Spatial Sound Studio, the only permanent 4D sound installation in North America, and she'll tell us about that. And last but not least is Stefan Chemlik, and he is a leading integrated healthcare expert and the inventor of the state-of-the-art system Sensate, founder of BioSelf Technology and New Medicine Group in London, England, a leader in integrated healthcare. He's a mindfulness mentor and clinical expert in the use of sound technology, a thought leader on vagal toning, and on top of that, he's a published and best-selling author and has written and contributed to numerous articles on health. So I'd love to get this conversation started. Um, and we could just go around this virtual room and just hear about your individual journeys um, that have brought you to today and the description of your current work or project. Kate, do you mind starting us off and tell us a bit about yourself? Oh, sure. Um, said, you said a lot there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So yeah, I'm uh, located in Vancouver, BC, which is on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, um, as well as uh, the uh, spatial sound studio I co-founded, Loeb, um, is also located there. 
Um, I started working in sound design when I was a teenager and um, mainly in theater. I went to school for that. I did my audio engineering um, and kind of simultaneously, I have um, meditation sound healing practice and uh, those kind of came up together separately uh, in me. And then um, when I found uh, 4D Sound, which is a company um, out of Amsterdam, but they have, a, they have a system, a big system in Budapest where they were hosting artist residencies. Um, in 2018, I did a two month artist residency there and um, I didn't, I just kind of went and I didn't really know what was gonna come of it. Um, but I ended up making this um, guided meditation, um, spatial sound guided meditation called Stagmos. Um, and then came back from, uh, came back to Vancouver and was like, I need to continue this <laughs> somehow. And uh, I met, um, well, and then another artist who had been there, Ado Van Bremen reached out to me uh, after hearing my work. Um, and we met for coffee and he said, do you wanna open a spatial sound studio? And I said, okay. And then we did. <laughs> so that was in 2019. And then um, Loeb opened its doors in uh, January, 2020 and uh, very quickly shut them again for a while, but we're up and go running again. And we've had about 30 artists come through the doors and make unique pieces and um, everybody interprets the system really differently. And it's really exciting to have this community of artists working in spatial sound and uh, getting to work with this like really cool technology in this really cool room. Um, and uh, yeah, does that, that's about it. That's me. <laughs> that That's wonderful. I would love for you to just Break down 40 sound and the and Loeb Studio for, for audience members that might not be familiar with spatial sound and what the experience of being in that room would be like. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll explain the technology a little bit. So uh, 4D sound is a, a proprietary software. Um, they're a, a brand, a company out of Amsterdam, like I said, and they um, worked kind of in line with um, Bloomline, uh, who developed these omnidirectional speakers that are about yay big. And they're like crazy high fidelity, beautiful speakers. Um, and in Loeb, um, we have nine of those across the ceiling, nine of those same omnidirectional speakers embedded in the floor, and then 16 uh, Viber transducers, which are a speaker transducer that's um, strapped directly into the floorboards, um, all individually channeled, at, oh, and one sub. Um, and, uh, but what that kind of creates and what 4D sound allows, uh, the software allows for you to move sound around in, in three dimensions um, around the whole room and outside the walls of the room. Um, and, uh, it's more like a, it, it creates a sound field. So the artist isn't having to think about channels and speakers. It, the speakers, the system and the speakers disappear and you're more thinking about um, how you want the sound to, to move around and, and it's like a, a choreographing the sound. Some people describe it as. Um, so yeah, and, and 40 sound is like, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It, it, it's an incredible software. Um, and it's you can it's very quick to learn the basics of how to say like I want a sound to be this big and I want it to be here, um, and then it, you can go really in depth and and learn all the incredible uh, capabilities and and create these like incredible immersive worlds where you entirely lose yourself um, in in the in the sound in the sound world. Is that How's that? <laughs> oh. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, why don't we jump over to Joel and hear a bit about your story and your path and then your project Chromasonic. Cool. Hi, I'm Joel. Um, I think really quick, I experienced the 4D sound experience in Berlin 
a few years back at the People Festival. Today, they had an installation there at the broadcast studio where Nils Fromm has his, his studio, right? I don't remember the name of it. Um, Monum. Uh, Monum, exactly. Is that the same system? It is, yeah, yeah. It's a bigger yeah. system, uh, so there's more speakers, more, ch more was, channels. It's incredible. So when you're talking about it, I get excited because I remember the feeling I had in that space was phenomenal. So, um, cool. <clears throat> my journey began. I mean, I've been playing music my whole life, basically. Um, playing guitar mainly has been my main instrument. And early on, not early, like half. There was a moment when I was sort of 18 or 19 years old and I was trying to be Jimi Hendrix and I realized it was never going to be Jimi Hendrix that I, I made a shift in my mind that I was no I wasn't going to try to be like any other guitar player or musician I was just going to try to find my own way of doing things um and so I started to really explore like retuning the guitar not that that's there's nothing innovative that I do it's just doing it my way so it's 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 this idea of like exploring the instrument um, and getting whatever kind of sounds I can get out of the instrument. And tr a lot of times not trying to go for the more traditional or uh, styles or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so my approach to guitar has always been from like the side and I'm not, I'm not educated in music. Um, so I didn't have the sort of the rules. I didn't really understand the rules, which was a good thing and a bad thing. Now, later in my life, I, I wish I had actually learned more theory, which is never too late, but um, I'm sidetracking. But ultimately, guitar has always been this place to express emotion. Music has been a place to express feeling. Um, and I've always been able to, it doesn't matter what artist I'm playing with, um, early on when I was in my early 20s, um, I played on Alanis's first album and that kind of put me into the session world of, of playing on records and Glenn Ballard, who wrote, co-wrote and co-produced or produced that record with Alanis, continue to bring me in on a lot of things. And then from there you meet other musicians and you're, you're just in it. Like once you're in the world and you're in the wor or wor world and working all the time. And I learned as I went um, and I always wanted to approach things differently. And, and that just kept as technology has improved with, with, with effects and so on and so forth, I was able to utilize those things to keep manipulating the guitar and keep um, exploring ways to create soundscapes and, ambient tones and just sort of vibrational, emotional things that were generated from the guitar, from the electric guitar or the acoustic guitar. Um, <clears throat> so at a point, literally would be brought in to be like the vibe guy on pop music, you know, like just do a pass of this like surreal kind of ambient stuff. And that would be, you know, mixed in on tracks. And I started to really be interested in, in why the simplicity of just a few tones swirling around each other would still affect me emotionally, still affect me, still take me on a journey. So I started to strip away what, let's call it the pop song, right? The structure of the pop song, stripping away the rhythm at first and stripping away the vocal and stripping away the bass line and stripping away. And I would just strip it down to basically ambient guitar, right? And so that took me on this whole journey of exploring frequency and um, cymatics and you, you know, there, there's this thing of, I don't know if you guys know it, but you take, you know, frequency like sand on a vibrating plate and you send in a particular frequency and a mandala kind of forms in the sand and it comes like this. And so there was this question of 440 versus 432. Um, there's a lot of controversy around all that. Um, so because there's a lot of controversy, <laughs> it gets into like stuff about the Nazis and it gets into other things. I mean, all that was just like, whoa, this is way too much. The internet is a very strange place. I decided to do my own experiments and would record the same things at 440. And then it's all relative. So 440, if people that don't know, it's concert pitch, they, they call concert pitches A440. And so that's every, and now I think it's up to 444 um, in some places because the higher or the, the higher the relative pitch is, the tighter the instruments, the loud, the long, the, the louder the project. Um, so with 440 versus 432, I was noticing and that in my body, I felt more settled when I was recording and creating music at 432. So I decided I was going to exclusively make my ambient music 432, um, relative to 432. Um, and that set me on this whole thing of like, 
wanting to remove the performer from a performance. So there would be this thing of you, you know, the I'm, I, being a touring musician as well for many, many years, there's always this us and them factor that happens. Um, and it's that idol, idol, idolization thing that happens, which I've never been a, a fan of. I always thought it was stri like strange that it was us up here and 30 feet away, there's this giant ocean that's super impersonal. Um, and people's experiences are always kind of external. They're there because they're focusing their attention on something that's outside of them. It's affecting something inside of them, but it's something that is outside of them. And I found I wanted to create this sort of immersive experience where the experiencer was in the middle of the experience and there was no performer. And I would want to do those live and I would be on the outside. It was not about watching me noodle on the guitar and these sounds happening. It was about sitting in the middle of the space. And I was out touring with um, a band called Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. And Orfeo McCord is one of the founding members. He and I quickly bonded over very similar ideologies and, and interests in the somatic effects of music. And he comes from deep studies in Africa and, and with the percussion and trance states. And we just hit it off immediately. We both and, and decided that we wanted to kind of explore this thing together, create a project together. And in that, we thought like vibration frequency, is there a correlation between sound to light, light to sound? And through that, we met an incredible visual multimedia artist named Johannes Giardoni, who had already been doing deep dives into for, for about 10, 15 years, he was already working with physical space and doing light to sound translations through frequency mapping um, and refracting the light into these particular geometries, which created these boundless states. He's a total badass. Um, and we showed him our work that we had been like that we had recorded and all our philosophies he expressed his he showed us this sculpture he made called metaspace and about four four and a half years ago is when we met a little after that we formed chromosonic with the attention the intention of creating um large-scale public artworks that really allow the experiencer to get to heightened states of awareness um to let go of narrative to really connect to themselves and through connections to themselves can connect to others so you know the intention of the studio is to create community to create connection and to create awareness um and we were very clear they are when i first started doing these sort of like live performances people were calling them sound baths and i had an allergic reaction to it being a sound bath because i'm not a healer i'm an artist and a performer in that sense and i saw it as more performance art and an experience as opposed to a sound bath and meeting Johannes and Orfeo, we, we had very similar ideas about that, that, you know, we, we come, our work is from an artistic lens and the work, the, the, the experiences that we create for people allows people to connect to themselves. It can be healing. It can be transformative. It can be all of that, but we're not trying to pose as healers. And that that's, I just want to clear that up because a lot of people just clump up, oh, you're doing sound baths. It's, that's a whole art form in itself. So that's my journey. That's why I'm at. I'm sorry if I took too long. No, not at all. That was great. Um, I love the details. I love the process is so fascinating. Um, let's jump over to Stefan and um, let's hear that story. Um, I, great listening to both your stories. Uh, Loeb Studios makes me really want to come and visit Vancouver again. Um, I'd love to see that space. Uh, and actually, and, and uh, Joel, I listened to uh, some of your albums, uh, some of the stuff. It's really nice. Great Thank ambient you. stuff. I, um, what was it? Hours, particularly, I thought would really translate into kind of vibe acoustic uh, stuff. Um, you can talk about and, that. And, and, yeah, no, absolutely. And if we get a great, we, I think we need a chromosonic in, in London. Um, That's the intention. It's, it's, it's the intention is for it to be global. So. Soon. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about that. Uh, I don't know if you know the Dream Machine, uh, Anil Seth, um, John um, Hopkins, uh, this, that's going on in London at the moment. Slightly similar, but um, yeah, the sort of amazing, almost psychedelic like experience, uh, yeah. which is on in London at the moment, which I went to. Um, I mean, my, my background is in uh, originally in meditation, really. So, dad taught me and my brother to meditate when I was very young. Um, I can't remember exactly what age because I was that young. Uh, and that's kind of really informed uh, my life and my practice and everything I've done since. Um, 
uh, I became uh, I trained in medicine uh, and, and for the last 35 years, 33 years, whatever it is, I've been uh, uh, working with uh, chronic and complex patients. Uh, and I founded New Medicine Group in Harley Street about 18 years ago, which uh, was the UK's main integrated healthcare team. We had 300 years of clinical experience in the team um, at, our, at our height. I've now Focus, I'm now focusing my energy um, on Sensate and Biosoft Technology, the company and the product. Uh, really due to impact, um, I realized that my ability to have global impact was limited in an upmarket clinic in, in London. Uh, and really the only way that I could have the kind of impact um, and change positively that the sort of the number of lives that I'm, I'm, I think we need to change to have a tipping point. Uh, was through um, music, which we could digitize, hardware and apps, etc. But I've used I've used sound and particularly low frequency sound, infrasound, in my work for a very long time. As I said, the team specialized in kind of complex and difficult conditions, and my own particular interest was in trauma and PTSD and anxiety and insomnia, kind of mental, emotional, functional states, um, which you know has tended to go um, underrecognized in, in in the medical profession. So I was, I was, I was st sticking um, speakers inside pillows, you know, like 30 years ago and playing around with that. And then about 15 years ago, we um, got a call from one of my doctors in, in, in uh, Switzerland at the Kuznacht practice, right, um, the high end practice out there. And we were developing some IV protocols for them, but they had this kind of technology. Um, uh, uh, and the doctor said, you know, it's the first time he'd seen kind of technology which was convincing in terms of its ability to have a kind of neurological effect. So I had a look at that and we, and we, became, we, we became the, you know, brought that to London and started using that with all our patients, really. And it was a kind of zero gravity sound bed, big transducers built into it, you, you know, water headphones. Um, it had been developed and tested for on the US Army for veterans coming back from Iran and Iraq with PTSD and had you know, spectacular results uh, for mental emotional conditions in particular and it was fantastic um, and it worked really well it, it uh, enabled all our clients all our patients to improve faster uh, and more fully than they would have done had they not had that part as, as part of their care but then actually on on the using the tech one day I had this kind of eureka moment and I realized that um, in terms of impact and scaling we could get rid of 99 percent of the hardware by turning the body into the instrument and that's really what we did. So I, I had the whole kind of thing downloaded, really. I filed a patent in 2015, that's now granted. Um, and it's for the use of uh, infrasound, uh, low frequency sound on the chest. Uh, so via, so you're experiencing infrasound, low frequency sound uh, via bone conduction and turning the chest into um, a resonating speaker. You know, it's, it's, you know, you guys know what, what I'm talking about. You know, you, you might have a beautiful uh, speaker, but unless you have a beautiful, a wooden cabinet to put that speaker in, it's not gonna sound very good. So the device, the sensate is like the speaker, but the your, your body, your chest, your thorax, and, and the hollow space, the air in, in your chest, that's like you know the beautiful resonating cell. And it's resonating internally, so it's then having an effect on uh, the air, it's kind of vibrating the column of air here in the chest, and that's then having a knock-on effect on the water. Uh, the other cellular mediums, intercellular mediums in the body. So there's, there's an interesting fact, which is that um, speed of sound in water is many times faster than nerve conduction speed. So whereas nerve conduction speed is only about 300 meters a second, which is you know more than fast enough if you've only got to get from the fingertip to the brain, um, speed of sound in water can be up to 3,000 meters a second. Uh, so it's, it's in a, so, so sound <laughs> we hear things before our brain registers that we've heard them and if that sound is being played internally then that's also true so um i think i think we've got got to the point where we kind of venerated or venerating the brain and the brain's amazing i love the brain um but i but i think you know we've, we've had a, a lower if you like nervous system for hundreds of millions of years longer than we've had a, a human so um, a bit like you were, um, if I can quote Dave here, um, you know, the, the, the whole body is a sound vessel. The whole of the body hears and feels sound. And we, we've, we've tended to focus on compression of airwaves in the ears, 
Um, but actually, I think that's only half of what music is. It's only half of what sound is. I think the other half is the, is the sound receptors uh, in the fascia um, of our body. And uh, we did a lot of the early developmental work at, um, on, 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 on the, uh, the discovery of fascia as a sensory organ back in 2012. In fact, the, um, the, the second ever fascial, fascial, International Fascial Congress was, at, it was in Vancouver, which is why I was there in 2012 talking uh, at the event. Um, and you know, we, our discovery and our understanding of what fascia connective tissue in the body is and what it means has, got, you know, has grown and grown over the last uh, decade or two. Uh, and as, as well as being, amongst other things, the physical embodiment, it's really clear now of, say, for instance, something like the acupuncture channels, uh, you know, the traditional description of uh, acupuncture channels 2000 years ago are almost identical when you read the kind of latest um, anatomical descriptions of connective tissue in current journals now. It's, it's fascinating the similarities between the two. But also fascia is basically water you know, suspended in a gel-like substance, if you like. So, you know, this fantastic, we, you know, we have these, this water rich tissue throughout our entire body, which is an amazing medium for sound, particularly for vibration. Um, just one final point, really, because I, you know, this, I'm a bit obsessed with this and I love this. Um, uh, you know, vibration was our first sense. Uh, and that's critical, right? So before we could hear or see or smell or anything else, our first sense, you know, we would have sensed the environment around us by you know, through our little feelers um, and, we, and we would have had feedback um, about the world through vibration. So in a sense of vibration is so infinitely more deeply hardwired into our system than any other sensory information. Um, and it's so, you know, so hardwired that we kind of tend to forget about how important vibration is. So I love Dave um, and you guys, you know, there's artists and entrepreneurs who are uh, focusing on how important this is for humans uh, and it's a fantastic way to change the way the body feels without talking about how the body feels beautiful um thank you so much stefan that there was so much knowledge and 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 science around all the stuff we're talking about i want to kind of move into to and um, we're talking about vibration and all three um project spaces are obviously using vibration but there's a there's that creativity component in terms of composition and art and, and Joel touched on a lot of his process um, and the sensate device for people that don't know there there's there's a, there's music that that um, is paired along with vibration. I would love to just hear maybe Kate want just talk about the process of creating for these this these type of environments versus you know composition. Again, we we think of Traditionally, you know, stereo, um, an instrument, listening with our ears. But I assume the process for designing anything that is deeply immersive, um, that includes, and I want to talk to Joel about how you compose with light. But Kate, maybe you want to talk about your process and how you think creatively in those environments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... <laughs> Creating in, in spatial sound, it's something that I was trying to do before I found 4D sound with like through a very like, um, like just needlessly complex. <laughs> um, but I was always trying to like move sound around the audience and, and, and I was finding that I needed to like, I couldn't, um, all of my composition and sound designs prior to 4D was just done in headphones or studio monitors. Um, and then I would kind of like guess, I would be like, and then it, it does this. Um, and then I would have to wait until I was in a in the theater space to, to do a lot of that moving sound around and, and feeling depth. And, um, but I like was thinking like from, from my, the beginning of starting to work with sound was that like, it has this ability, sound specifically has this ability to um, change our emotion and, and evoke emotion. And 
there's and it can and it can be so powerful just and kind of anecdotally this is just what i experienced so getting to work in the spatial sound environment really was just like i i was my my brain was already there i was already prepped for like i, I it was the next step of what i wanted to do with sound um and then what i learned when I actually got to um, work with the system was that the, um, it's, the system in itself is an instrument. The, the room, regardless of the system is an instrument. You're working with resonant frequencies. You're working with the bodies in the space. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's the, the what I talk about with artists when they come into lobe is like, you know, try not to, or before they come into lobe is like, I'm like, try not to plan out your experience in entirety um, before you know, before you've experienced working with the system for a little bit, because it is just like, it, it's, it's another instrument you're composing, but you're also choreographing and you're using the room and the sound itself to, to create that, immersion and now I've forgotten the question <laughs> and, but it was part that was I think that was half of it and then well I, I think I think you hit on it right there I think that was such, such a brilliant insight when artists come into that space they have yeah. to kind of remove themselves from the familiar or the baggage they come into thinking about how to how to design sound and, and, and you're yeah. right everything is part of the process the body's in the room the room is an instrument the participants yeah. are instrument, and Joel touched on that as well. It's not this the separation between performer and audience. It's all one and the same. So I think that was exactly what I was looking for to understand what yeah. it's like to have to think differently creatively in that space. Yeah, and compo and com like creating the sound that you're that. Um, I think a really important part of it is that you're in the space that the final presentation is going to be in. So like a, a lot of my, I, I do composition for theaters, but, um, and I do sound, sound design for theatrical productions, but it, I have to do at least in part, I have to be in the space. And ideally like with Loeb, like that's the final presentation um, space. And so when I'm um, designing and composing in there, it's, I'm immersed in it. We roll the desk into the middle of the room. We roll it into different, areas of the room and, and listen from different spaces. And uh, the other thing I say to do is like stand up and walk around and listen in, in different spots because it's not, um, it's not a sweet spot. There's like, and um, something we were talking about. Oh, okay. I wanted to, I wanted, <laughs> um, something we, we talk about a lot is, is um, the concept of uh, spatial empathy. Mm -hmm. is, a, is a concept that I'm working on a project with uh, UBC right now um, to kind of to try to um, materialize and lobe and um, my um, teammate and uh, Hannah Acton and I talk a lot about how um, lobe can be this like really literal representation of or spatial sound can be this really literal representation of um we're both in the same room but i'm here and you're here and we're both listening to the same thing but we're having totally different experiences and um how we can just by pointing that out it can be this like really literal visceral representation of how my experience is different than yours there's no way i could know your experience um yeah that's amazing um it just reminds me of my experience of chromosonic maybe joel we can jump into you and in talking about uh chromosonic is an individual experience even though everyone's listening and feeling the same thing but i'd love to maybe dive into your process in terms of like we talked about it before but composition using light as part of your sonic composition i think it's just you guys have developed technology to be able to do that and and it shines in a, the chrome sonic experience thanks man I'm, I'm i'm really quick i'm having my own spatial audio experience there's a, a little tiny mosquito buzzing around so if i'm whipping I'm, I'm not there's not it's there's literally a mosquito around my um i really 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 um 
connect with with what you're saying in terms of spatializing, like creating uh, sound, the sound experience in the space, <clears throat> and having to really be in the space. So I'll work backwards in in that sense, just to touch on that, because we, we the end result we call it fine tuning. We have to do in the space, you know, on the technology that we developed. We can we have a visualizer, so we can map out the general experience um, visually and sonically. Um, but then we call it the fine tuning. We have to take you know all of our, our our spaces. We move the thing into the space, and we're in it. And Johannes, Orfeo, myself, and our 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 engineer Ryan, um, we sit there and work, and it takes a couple of days to really fine tune the experience and going back and forth and inside and you know trying different spaces in the room. And yeah, in Chromasonic, the intention is to create, it's an individual experience um, designed to, to, with the intention of experiencing it in community. So like you were saying, the spatial empathy, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing concept because it's a form of connection. And we, my experience is never going to be the same as your experience, as you said, period, in any kind of thing. But in your experience, it's an exact same thing. So that thing that you can communicate afterwards is a form of connection. And it's a form of bonding and it's a form of like, oh, I'm not in this alone. And so anyways, so process. Um, Johanna said something very early on in the beginning of the project because I come from music, so you know, quote unquote, and I kept trying to be musical in the initial programming and composition of um, our early experiences. And it was, he said, you can't think in terms of music. You have to think in terms of sound and frequency and it was a it was just a boom an aha moment because he's not coming from music he's coming from light frequency and turning it mapping it to become sound frequencies so, and so it was the opposite we do sound to light currently and we do light to sound we do both and the way we do it is through frequency mapping so you literally whatever sound is created is creating a light a color um a frequency and the intensity the decay the fluctuation, the, 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 all of it is completely dependent on the sound that's being created. So our technology in real time is creating the light frequency based on whatever sonic um, <clears throat> input it's getting. So really quickly, you could create something that is sounds beautiful, but you just get sort of a white light. You know, it doesn't actually do much in sort of shifting frequency and stuff, or you can get a beautiful shift of colors that, creates a, a, an intense dissonance in the sound. And dissonance is not a bad thing. We use dissonance to sort of dig a little bit deeper and then you give an aha where you, you release. Um, it's like, you know, imagine a whale going deep, deep, deep into the ocean and stirring the ocean. You know, it's the same thing when you take those kind of like, you hear those boop, 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 those opposing frequencies we've experienced during like sound bowls or, you know, low end frequencies that are rubbing and it's, it's two vibrate, it's literally two vibrations that are not meeting so they're bouncing they're they're until one settles you know and one takes over and that that moment of whatever you want the dissonance that is that that does something to us on a totally in our bodies um so we play with all of that and we we don't come to it through like a, a scientific mind even though there's a science to it and a, it's it's really through a, a feel thing, and then we we have to trust our experience as artists and you know composers and 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 all that. And, and at the end result, how does this feel? Right? It's always at the end of the at the end of this, how does it feel? And we've had many conversations with notable neuroscientists um, who have all been really curious and fascinated with, with the work that we're doing. And without saying names, one of them said who cares what the thing says? If you think it's happening, it's happening. Like if you're feeling it, it's happening. And that was a big sort of like green light for us. Cause we do a lot of stuff, you know, from our technical backgrounds, but the end, like I said, at the end result, it's just a feeling thing. And how does this make you feel? And we use, it's in like, it's in common culture. You hear that thing of like, Oh man, that guy's got a bad vibe or, man, their person's not meeting me at my frequency. You know, we talk like that's in our language and there's no difference in terms of like an experience is going to meet you wherever you're at. So if someone's coming into Chromasonic and they're having a really bad day, there might be some uncomfortable moments for them. And through that discomfort, they'll get to a place of 
calm and, 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 and feeling lighter or feeling more in tune, really. It's like when you're out of tune, you're just out of tune. A guitar, blah, 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 blah. And then you tune everything and it's like, it flows, right? We're designed to flow. We're designed to be in harmony. So we, we go with that. I don't know if that answers it, but. No, it answer, answers it beautifully. Um, I'm hoping through this conversation, the audience is going to be dying to check out Loeb, check out Chromasonic and buy a Sensei. Just putting that out there because I think <laughs> this is what I want to convey to the audience. It's really about there's so much more to explore in ourselves through sound and not through our headphones right. and in all the experiences where we can absorb sound. I even talk about just get out to more concerts where there's a light show. You've got just so many more modalities and a community of people that are in sync to that performance. Like it's just those kind of experiences that we need to um, have more of. Um, I want to just hear a little more about the Sensei device and maybe Stefan, you can just talk about um, what the experience is like and how you um, composed content for, for the platform. Um, because I think that's really, it's a fascinating device. It's super powerful. Um, so I'd love to just expose the audience to that. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, let me get a tiny heavy um, bit out of the way um, about kind of the motivation really behind wanting to be a mainstream provider. So, you know, having gone from being a relatively um, niche provider to a few thousand people to developing a product, which we plan to have an impact for millions of people. So, you know, the, 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 my personal vision is to have had a positive impact on 100 million people's lives by 2025. Uh, that doesn't mean they all have to have, uh, although it'd be nice, uh, they don't all have to own those 100 million people a, um, a sense eight device. But an example of that the other day uh, is a um, somebody who wrote to us, and he happened to be a veteran, uh, American US veteran, wrote to us with you know, suffering from severe PTSD uh, and hasn't been able to leave the house for five years um, uh, and wrote to us two weeks after having his sensei and said, you know, for the first time in five years, I was able to go out for a meal with my family. So him and four other people, so that's five people whose lives actually are different and are better for the fact that, you know, he's using this technology. And so that's the kind of level that we're working at, really. I mean, I, um, and here's the heavy bit, right? You know, I, I have this view that we're, 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 you know, we're pretty much running out of time. Uh, we have two and a half years um, to make major changes to the way um, the major majority of the people on the planet live their lives if we want to stay under the necessary temperature raise, um, um, which is, which is going to reduce the impact of uh, climate uh, change, climate warming um, for the majority of the population. And as far as I can see, the only way we can do that is um, to get people to stop panicking. Yeah, so people are locked, and for, there's various, you know, we could have a whole conversation about just this, right? There's, there's various reasons why people are locked into this kind of flight, fight, freeze, autonomic um, dysregulation state, uh, you know, just overwhelmed by work, overwhelmed by media, overwhelmed by messaging, uh, and overwhelmed by negative news. I mean, the world's the safest place it's ever been in, in, from a data point of view, but yet people feel more terrorized than they've ever felt so there's there's this kind of there's this map mismatch there that doesn't actually fit with the reality of the situation and i think as long as people feel overwhelmed traumatized um, and uh, adrenalized they're not thinking about the medium to long-term solutions they're just thinking about how do i get through the rest of this day so for me and, and I, so i you know we can talk about these messaging as much as we want to individuals but that doesn't change behavior yeah, what changes behavior is people feeling different. And, and music, as you know, you've, we've all said, has a fantastic potential for making people feel different without them even knowing why. Yeah, and it's more powerful in a way than in many, many ways than talking to people and explaining and giving them the data, giving them the facts. Uh, that can, people can just get lost in intellectual arguments around that. If you make people feel better and they feel better on a regular basis, their autonomic nervous system, and we particularly focus on the role of the vagus nerve uh, in feeling good. You know, if you can increase vagal nerve tone, you increase people's ability to be resilient to negative news and to stress. Yeah, so that, that's our mission: is to uh, get a, you know, a tipping point of people uh, better able to cope with reality and bad news. 
And I think if we can do that, then people will start thinking slightly longer term and make different decisions about how they live in the world. Um, <clears throat> so, 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 so Sensei does require the use of hardware. Um, we did experiment with not using it, but um, you, you, know, you, uh, you, you simply have to have a transducer which is capable of producing full, frame, uh, full range frequencies and, and, and infrasound. So the kind of the, uh, it's not haptic. Um, uh, so the kind of haptic vibration you get in your phone, in your watch is non-tuned rattling. Basically, it's great for alarms. You know, if you want to um, set an alarm or have a Apple Watch warn you when you when you stop breathing, then haptic vibration is great. You know, physical feedback on your fingertips where most of the touch receptors are. You know, so you, so if something feels more three D, uh, haptic vibration works very very well. Haptic vibration isn't capable of producing physiological changes to state. It's not really capable of, of uh, impacting on the connective tissue and the fascia. Uh, or having any kind of deep neurological signaling to the body or the brain. So you, know, you need you need infrasound for, to do that. And then you know you need the chest to, to magnify, to amplify that sound so the whole body feels it. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> um, so we, we, we try not to make the device too small. We could actually miniaturize it further, uh, but this is basically the sensei. Uh, so this sits on your chest. Uh, you pop your headphones on, you control it via the app, and you choose the track and you hit go. And the way we compose the track, so I work with some very talented and gifted composers. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I create the inspiration around how, what, what the, the sort of feel and the outcomes I'm looking for from the track, and then we work together and we compose this stuff. And the, the tracks are one piece of music. So it's not that they, we, we write audio and then there's a rattle, a vibration going on. It's that the... Uh, the infrasound, the low frequency portion of the track is part of the orchestration. So in the same way that, um, say, a lot of sacred music uh, consisted of an involved um, non-audible uh, frequencies, um, that's kind of what we do. So if you look at stuff um, like Monteverdi and Bach, they were using non-audible frequencies within their compositions. So for instance, the church organ um, has is two, has two octaves which which are below hearing threshold, uh, and I've tested this. Right, I've been in a couple of you know big cathedrals, and I've got I managed to grab, find the, the you know the organ player, um, and go behind the scenes and get him to show me this. And it's true, you know, he hits bottom whatever it is, one of these one of these octaves, and you hear nothing, and then slowly, the whole building starts to thrum. And I think you know we so we've used infrasound forever, right? In sacred music and humming and chanting. This is what we're doing in a sense in many ways, this is exactly what it's doing. It's duplicating the kind of experience that you would get with singing, omming, chanting, humming. Um, uh, but those are surprisingly difficult to do well and to do properly. And also because people are locked into this kind of anxiety state, people really worry whether they're doing it properly. So they don't do them. So um, as Anna Goodmanson, my very talented uh, um, co-founder and CEO says, um, you know, the therapy that works is the one that people do. Yeah, um, and if, if it, so it has to be enjoyable, it has to be engaging, it has to be easy, and you have to want to do it almost immediately after you've just done it, because then you get the engagement and then you get kind of mass adoption. And we're all about mass adoption here yeah, because we want hundreds of millions of people to be able to self-regulate. So the tunes themselves, you, 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 you select in the app, they're audible and they're really nice and, they're and, they're, and we're now you know, moving everything over to spatial audio. Um, but then the everything below 20 hertz, all the low frequency stuff is felt rather than heard. So we, you know, we're trying to incorporate the whole body. Um, and the way, I think, you know, the way I kind of think about it is recorded sound is, 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 has never been natural. Yeah, you know, the way you, you, the, the music is on, on a recording isn't how we hear music. I mean, we had mono, obviously, originally, which is like one dimensional sound. And then we had stereo, which is, again, very artificial, really, two sources of sound, kind of like two dimensional sound. And now, uh, obviously, we have um, spatial audio, which is amazing. So now we're getting something like where you can place sound in space. Um, and so it's, it's fantastic for getting a sense of movement and dynamism. 
um, and a much more experience which is much closer to being at a concert or hearing um, sound as we naturally hear it. Uh, and, and, and I like to think of sound acoustics, which is what we do with set, what, we, what we call what we do with sensor is 4D. So you've got the spatial sound, but you've also got physical sound, tactile sound in the body. Yeah, I love it. Um, it's, I guess I want to, I want to ask the group outside of, you know, the context of your, your projects, how do we move? <laughs> Maybe it's a big, difficult question to answer. Like I always talk about, we're, we're at this stage where it's, it feels like we're like this AirPod generation where we're like losing more hearing than we're gaining. Cause we're just, you know, sticking our earbuds in and that's where we're, that's where we're experiencing music and sound. And clearly from all this discussion, there's so much more that we're missing. So, um, you know, outside of your individual projects or other products, projects that you know about, like how does one access this ability without needing to a device or a, or, you know, a studio to, to do it. Like, where, where does it happen in our natural environment? Joel, I, I noticed you just kind of immediately perked up there. I have a theory about that. It, it, it's ultimately silence. We need to spend more time in silence. Like, we need to spend more time just in our environment without creating more noise. We are the noisiest species. Um, what we've done to our oceans and the animal life in the oceans, they can't, you know, whales can't find each other's mates and they're, you know, we all the sonar and the, 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 you know, all the frequencies that we're we're creating so much noise on the planet, and it's super disruptive. And so when I think about like really trying to connect to, to to like the concept of listening or whatever is to turn everything off. And you know, like I drive in silence. I often, unless I have to like listen to a mix or, you know, make some phone calls, I, I tend to just keep things quiet. And I think if we spent we don't need to have music on at restaurants and because all we do is talk loud like to, to get over the sound of the music we just get louder and it's just this competition for volume right and there's no reason to have background music on at half the things that we do so i, I would say like turning things off if we could just start to turn more off we would be able to experience more if that makes sense mm -hmm. you know yes. um, like when i see people you know i live in Topanga, i hike on a daily basis when people are hiking with their earbuds in, they're missing out on one of the most incredible gifts. The the sounds that are around you, they it, it's it's unbelievable. It's bird songs and you know the the sounds of the wind and the, the leaves rustling and scurry things scurrying on the ground and there's so much happening. It's like talk about a spatial audio experience. There's no you know it's all right there in our backyards. Just step outside and shut the fuck up. I don't know if we cuss, but. You know, <laughs> <clears throat> so sorry to get that in post yeah yeah to, yeah, to, add, to add on to that like i i completely agree like the the silence it, it is i i had this thought when i was like really young that like the that um i was listening to to billy talent <laughs> um and I, there was this moment in a song that like, it, it, there was like a, this giant build to like silence and that silence was my favorite part of the song. And I was like, it's the absence of sound that's like, because we we've, we've built all this up and then the excitement for, for, the, for when it came back, but like the, that silent chunk um, and like your attention is brought to that silent chunk um, by what's surrounding it. So um, that it just like has all this, this potency and, and energy around it. Um, and I had a similar experience, like starting to work with spatial sound of um, noticing what the, the spatial sound that was around me. I remember standing on the roof um, of the Spatial Sound Institute in Budapest and just being like, and there's a plane and there's the train. And, you know, like, I'm like, we're just, we're just in this all the time, but it, it's bringing attention to it, bringing attention to silence, bringing attention to the spatial audio experience that we are encapsulated by all the time. Um, and, and just having these moments of, of thinking of uh, about the sound that we're in. 
for, for hearing people. Um, on another note, um, just had a yesterday um, a group from the from the secondary school for the deaf in Vancouver came in um, and listened uh, experienced a piece by a deaf artist uh, Silas and um, that made a piece last year using the vibra transducers and I was um, listening through the interpreter uh, about them all talking about how their experience of moving through the world is through vibration. And they're used to hearing like the rain and they're used to hearing the, uh, the or experiencing the, the vibrations of like the garbage truck backing up or things like that. And uh, so cool to, to be that they could recognize the individual vibrations just like hearing able people can recognize sound uh, um, audible sound, um, and that's a spatial like that's a uh, a spatial experience as well. That's a that's a full body listening experience as well, um, and yeah, that's that's what I, I don't have like a conclusion ever. <laughs> no, that, that's that's I, I'm so glad you brought that project up because I, I was gonna ma I made a note to make sure you talked about that particular piece done by a deaf artist because I think. It speaks volumes to um, what we're talking about in, in that, you know, um, the vibration alone is such a powerful sense for your sense of space and your sense of connection. And it's not like it's not there. And then most of us are like, oh, you can't hear. It means you're missing this experience. But but so much of our experience is beyond that audible range. And that's a that's a beautiful um, project to highlight in that in that context. Yeah, and also just to, to the the the, I really got an understanding of of hearing as a spectrum, and that and people of along that hearing spectrum experience sound and vibration in different ways, um, and to to different degrees, and so that it's it's just really cool to to understand that yes, there is there is a, and also understanding that we need to there is a need to quiet our minds and the the audible sound that's around us, but also the understanding the vibration, the haptic sound uh, or the haptic, the noise that's happening at a subsonically, just as it's healing with Stefan's, um, as Stefan's talking about, I think it can also be disruptive and, and cloud our ability. Um, and I think that there is like uh, living in cities, I think that is, I would uh, hypothesize that the constant construction and the rumble of the traffic and things like that is adding to our, the subsonic frequencies are, is adding to our generalized anxiety. I would hypothesize that without really anything to back that up. Oh, I think you're right. I think there's volumes to back that up, but it just means we have to just increase our awareness and find moments like spending time and listening to the music of a forest is, is a perfect example. Don't run into the forest with your earbuds on playing a podcast because you can't stand um, life without something playing in your ears. What I'd love to do is um, maybe start wrapping this conversation up and I appreciate all your time to contribute to this conversation. But can we just do go around and do a quick plug for your project? Because I, I think there's a lot of concepts that are being that are that are probably novel for for people listening and just highlight your project and where people can get access to it or read about it um, or see it online and then physically visit it. Joel, you want to just mention what Chromasonic's up to and where people can find it? Yeah. Um, the project is called Chromasonic. Our website is uh, chromasonic.com. You can also find us on Instagram. And we are currently, our, our studio lab is based in Venice, California. And we have uh installations in telluride colorado in a defunct limestone mine which people can visit it'll be open later in the summer we have two sites actually three sites in los angeles currently we have um a space open at compound long beach um which is a walkthrough experience and compound long beach is an, is an amazing community uh, arts community down there um and then we have our our satellites which you experienced, mm -hmm. which is in Venice, California. Um, and we are opening up a large scale walkthrough 
um, experience later this year as well in Los Angeles. But the intention of the project is to go global, to be global. Um, so we welcome ideas and 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 if there's anybody listening to this or sees this and has interest in the project, you could reach out to any of us at chromosomic.com or on our Instagram. Um, we're very welcoming and uh, like to have chats with people doing interesting things in the world. Cool. Kate, what about your work in Loeb and projects that are um, publicly assess- accessible? For sure. Um, also, I just want to say that Joel has like a beautiful sunbeam coming <laughs> right now. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it just like emerged as you were speaking. So nice. Um, yeah, Loeb is a spatial sound studio. It's located in um, so-called Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, we're on the downtown east side, uh, Strathcona area of Vancouver. Um, you can find us online at loebstudio.ca, on Instagram at loebstudio underscore. Um, and we do, we hold, uh, we host artist residencies, uh, open application on our website um, with, with more information about what that entails. And um, welcome to, to contact me or, and the rest of the team on there. Um, and then we also have um, the artists that come through often do presentations uh, and we, that those are often uh, free tickets, um, but all of our programming is pretty much um, by donation, pay what you can. Um, and a lot of it is free. And uh, if anybody's interested and, and excited about spatial sound, I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you and, uh, and have uh, ongoing conversations, collaborations, yeah. Thank you. Stefan, finally with you. Uh, so Sensate is a hardware device that you use with your app uh, on your phone. Uh, it's Sensate, S-E-N-S-A-T-E. The website's getsensate.com. And uh, our users have recently completed 18 million minutes of Sensate time. And actually, I worked out from an impact point of view, that would have taken me over 300 years in clinic to have the same amount of uh, impact. So I'm, I'm, I'm already thrilled. Uh, I'm off Love to that start of our journey. Um, it's, I mean, really it's for the people that find it hard to meditate or relax, which it turns out, um, is, is really quite a lot of people. Um, uh, and there's a lot of people, there's one thing that's not really talked about enough, I think is meditation and breathing, training, mindfulness is actually a very significant proportion of people when they try to practice actually feel worse. Uh, the number of people that have panic attacks when trying to do breathing training. Uh, is quite significant. Uh, and it's not surprising, you know, we are in this heavily overwhelming um, information rich sound and uh, space limited, sound rich and space limited environment. Our, you know, our, our, our brains did not evolve to function well in this kind of environment. So we're completely overwhelmed most of the time. Uh, and, you know, what I discovered was that the available techniques that I'd trained in for years, we're no longer working with people, say breathing, mindfulness, uh, meditation, etc. cetera. Um, most people were unable to do. So really the purpose of Sensate is to uh, enable an, a normal person who would like to get better at relaxing, but finds it very hard to do um, the techniques to get to the point where their, uh, their autonomic nervous system, their vagus nerve is regulated enough so then they can feel good about doing a regular practice. And um, I'm sure we can. Uh, I'm sure we can give you a discount code uh, for the for, for the listeners, um, which you can pop onto the uh, the thing at the end. Right on. Well, um, let's wrap it up here. I want to just be so thankful for for all of you for joining from basically all over the planet. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I don't. I know I learned a ton. I hope the audience did the same thing, and hope they all check you you guys out. Um, So let's sign off for now and thanks for joining another episode of Immersed and we will see you again soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So good to be here. Thank you. Thank you.